Welcome to episode number 36 to the MFers podcast. I'm your co-host, Amir Man. I'm your co-host, Gordon Man. And we're excited to bring with you a new guest of ours, Mark Kamachi. Mark Kamachi. Mark Kamachi. Mark, do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Hey, well, guys, first off, thanks for uh, helping me inflate my own ego by being a guest on your show. So yeah. really uh, appreciate that. And you know, shout out to John Shallot who connected us. So it's, it's a connected world, right? Uh, I'm I'm originally from BC, so I'm a New Westminster born and bred kid. I grew up, um, and, and that's why I have a particular interest in this, is that I grew up in Queensboro. Do you guys know where that is? Queensboro. Yeah, 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 yeah it's yeah, right yeah. over there. You guys are young, but I, I grew up on Lulu Island, right beside Richmond. Yeah, and yeah. as a kid, it was off, it was a farm bill. Like, the, the Dolly Walls were my neighbors. Yeah. They had cows, chickens, pigs. Um, they had they had rhubarb. They had a field, wow. and uh, growing up as a kid, you know me and, and me and uh, their, his kids, you know we grew up together. And I kind of grew up on a farm, but my dad farmed the sea. He was a commercial fisherman, so wow. Queensboro was an all agricultural belt. So, you know, and you guys talk about strawberry picking. When I was a little kid, if I wanted to earn a living, I went blueberry picking in Richmond. Nice. I appreciate that. Remember, we have a little bit of resemblance because when we grew up. Um, we ne have never had any summers, you know, being berry farmers. Oh, uh, we were selling berries on the side of the road in a stand, in a like a 10 by 10 sh shack, you know, yeah. that my, parent, my dad had built. And that's how we spent all of our summers. So that's sweet. New, well, I mean, Queensboro, where I grew up now, is all, you know, Walmarts and, and big, big yeah. stores and, you know, houses and apartments and stuff like that. But yeah. growing up as a kid, it was all, it was all cows, chickens, and goats. So, yeah, yeah it was a lot of fun. Unbelievable. And then how did that, how, you know, when did, what age did you move to um, Alberta? Uh, oh God, now I'm dating myself. Uh, in, in my 40s, <laughs> late 30s, late 30s. So after uh, high school, I went to New Westminster Secondary. I went to Simon Fraser University for a couple of years. Nice. And I was kind of studying sciences and liberal arts. And my girlfriend at the time says, you suck at university. And I was working at the New Westminster Parks and Rec Community Center. And I was designing posters and newsletters and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And I had a knack for it. Not that I knew I had any kind of artistic ability, but, you know, she at the time said, you should look into art school. And, what did you go to university for, though? Well, I was taking general studies. So I took, first year I took sciences. So I did bio and, and, and calculus and all that stuff. And my second year, because I sucked at the sciences so bad, I took uh, English writing. I took... Uh, I took law, kinesiology, so a mix of everything. I mean, back then, if you had your, if you had your bachelor, bachelor's of art, you know, the whole, the world was your oyster, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, you didn't have to be, you didn't have to go to university thinking I'm going to be a brain surgeon or an accountant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, but with my dad being of Japanese descent, the war, right? He lost his education. He's born in Canada too, yet because he was oh, Asian, wow. he was shipped off the coast. So he always pushed my brother and I to, you know, I don't care. You could be a fisherman, a farmer, whatever you do, yeah. you get an education. That's, that's, that's the same thing with our parents. Yeah. 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 yeah, a lot of immigrant families, they come over here because they want their kids to do well. Yeah. And, yeah. and so my mom and dad's pushed us to go to school. But back then, you know, art, you think of art, you go, there's no living when it comes to art. You know, you're starving artist syndrome, right? Yeah, yeah. But uh, I learned about it's, it's essential to go to school. Like just, just to touch on this topic, because I'm going to forget. I have so many questions to ask you. Yep. Do you think it's essential to go to school nowadays? For what I do? No, just to go to school in general. Um, you know, in, I, I used to be really, you know, get a, get a postgraduate, you know, uh, get a degree. I think an education or that proof that you have some formal education there. But in this day and age within the do-it-yourself world, you meet so many people who, who have done it themselves. They go to YouTube, you know, I want to be a brain surgeon and they learn the tricks in the trade. But I think you really need to, in order to grow and really learn and be confident, you got to meet people in your life who are your mentors, people who are going to guide you. And that's the only thing when you're self-taught, you know, so much of it is the interaction and actually getting your, your hands wet. It would be no different than, you know, me coming to you guys go, Ah, you know, my dad had a garden, so that makes me a gardener. It you're doesn't right. work that way, right? You're right, you're right. It you need that education. opens up exactly what you're saying. Yeah. It opens up your entire world to yeah. so many different possibilities. Yeah. You literally, you're able to enter that, that, that virtual room. 
that you weren't able to beforehand. So, I mean, uh, some people have made successes learning and do it yourself, but I think, you know, you're going to learn more when you have people showing you the ropes, you'll learn quicker, you know, maybe, you know, you still have to make mistakes to learn. I got yeah. you. So you yeah. told your dad that you wanted to be an art, art student. You know, and, and you know what? And he said, art school, that's still a school. Go for it. Yeah. So I ended up going to, I, I quit university. I went to Langara, did some art courses there. And I thought, shit, this is, I like this. This is what I want to do. So yeah. I applied at the Ontario College of Art and I moved to Toronto. Wow. So I, I did, did school there, lived in Toronto for 10 years. And then the, the coast called me back and had a job offer in Vancouver with a wow. big agency. But while I was working at this agency, um, I met the marketing director for Whistler Mountain at the time. This was before Blackcomb. Yeah. So Kathy, I was doing some freelance for her. So I, every weekend I was sneaking up to Whistler, uh, do, helping them do work, doing trail maps, advertising. And she kind of said, you know, what are they paying you at the agency? I'll, I'll match that. You only have to work weekends pretty much and I'll give you a ski pass. So I moved to actually, I moved, actually moved to Squamish. Shit. I lived in Squamish for seven years so that I could commute downtown to my job as well as work up at Whistler. Sweet. Mm, yeah. Sweet. How, how was it? How, like, how did you get the opportunity to work for someone in the position as that, that, that lady in, in Whistler? How do, why do you think that she chose you? Or why do you think that she spoke to you? Uh, well, at, when I was working at Palmer Jarvis, which is the big agency of Vancouver, um, my writing partner, so I'm an art director and he's a, he's a writer. We work together as a team. He knew her. So he introduced me to her and, and the stuff she needed was more visual. So things like, you know, whether they were signage, menus, um, bibs for kids, ski schools, advertising, marketing, you know, and there was more visual stuff required than written, written stuff. So there was a lot of freelance work for me back then. Yeah. Um, but, but is it, do you think that your qual like your quality of work stood out? Or do you think that it was your just 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 that connection? Oh, no, it's, it's it's you know it's like the reputation you have for your berries. It's the quality uh, or your right. wine. You know, people there. There's so many. You know, I went, uh, my mom lives in White Rock, so when I was out there this summer, I went to my visit my cousin in downtown Vancouver. So yeah. I brought over a box of blueberries from Peace Arch Farms. Yeah, so I took it over to him, and you know. He and his kids ate them, and then he calls me back three days later. Where'd you get those berries from? Because they were way better than the ones they were getting from Richmond. There you go. You know, so again, it, you know, people know the difference between good quality work, crappy work. Hundred percent. Yeah. And, and again, again, at the end of the day, hundred yeah, percent. And, and so much of it, it comes down to also, you know, the person doing the work. You know, you got to get along with people. It's all about relationships, and whether it's my business or your business, right? Yeah. How did you, how did you become from an employee just to, to, to like, well, how, you're still, you're still in, in BC at this point, you know, yeah. you know, well, I guess you lived there for seven years, but then what, what happened at that point? So this big agency I was at, uh, Palmer Jarvis. So back then we, you know, had uh, great accounts to work on. Then I left to do a lot of my own freelance because Whistler was keeping me busy. So I was living in Squamish with my first wife and, uh, and, I had, I had an offer with another advertising agency in Vancouver. And at the time they had uh, America West Airlines. They had the Vancouver Canucks, so Orca Bay Sports. Oh, shit. They had um, Toyota BC dealers. And we had some other small accounts. And as a freelancer, I was making really, really good money. But the work as a freelancer, it, it wasn't the, the radio, the TV, the, the, the stuff everybody sees. A lot of the work I was doing was retail, you know, the, the secondary stuff because yeah. the guys at the agency who were hiring me were doing the good stuff. So yeah. I had this job with this other agency called Glenny Stamness. And I said to my wife at the time, I'm, I'm taking the full-time job because I miss doing advertising. I miss television, radio, print, and all that kind of stuff. And, and it was going to be half, half of what I was making at the time. Yeah, but why did you take the job though? Like out of nowhere, you took that job. Because I was starved for doing creative. I was doing stuff that I could do in my sleep. And I wanted wow. challenges. I wanted yeah. challenges. I wanted the bigger accounts. What did that do for you? Did, did that fulfill you? Like how long did you end up working there? What was the, what was the career path there? Um, again, see, I'm, I'm one of these guys who will value. It's not about money. It's about friendships. It's about connectivity. And, and when I was at this advertising agency, 
uh, two good buddies of mine, the creative director and the, the account director, good friends of mine, but they both were like this. And I was always in the middle and having to choose. So it literally it came down to a point where I went to the president of the company. I said, Bob, I wrote, I wrote a letter yeah. basically starting to say, Bob, you got to talk to these guys. This, this, this is poisonous in the, in the agency. But by the time I finished that letter, I had resigned. Wow. Said, oh my God. I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take sides over two friends of mine. No. Uh, to, to, to this day who are still friends of mine yet those two don't get together and 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 i had that's when well you know again and timing is everything because that's when the uh, the offer from calgary came on board because it was an acquaintance of mine who was in vancouver who came out to calgary and he said hey mark you want to come work on a fashion account in calgary and it's like fashion in calgary yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. But back then, there were no uh, head offices, really. Calgary had a ton of head offices because of oil and gas. Vancouver yeah. was just growing as an advertising mecca. Yeah. And so I came out here, my wife and I thought, well, let's try it for a couple of years. And Mark's work worse, warehouse being a national account. Yeah. And we just fell in love with Alberta. Like, I mean, we were living in a 900 square foot townhouse um, just off of Broadway near Granville Island. So we paid, I think, at the time, 240,000. So this is going like 20 plus years ago. Moved to Alberta for 180. We get this beautiful house Sweet. near the river. Like the, right. the real estate prices were night and day. Oh yeah, of course. I yes. don't mind minus 20 in sunshine. I'll take that over five degrees in rain in Vancouver. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm a steer, right? I'm oh, a steer. Okay. It's yeah, not I'm the same golfer. cold. It's not but, the same cold. You know, here, here it's like a wet cold. That's true. Oh. Out there it's like, you know, it's not the same. Yeah, exactly. You can go outside and do things, and as long as you dress for it, you know. I heard about it. Yeah, no, I was there. I was yeah. there last year in November, and I was out there, and it was snowing like crazy. You didn't feel that cold. No, here it's like five degrees. You feel freezing cold because it's, it's wet. Because it's wet. Uh, Even if you walk outside man. with a t-shirt, it's like cold. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It's the like moisture. Because when I was in Vancouver, it was shorts year round. When I came out here, it's like, nope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's unbelievable. Yeah. And then you slowly moved into your own agency, or, or what, what ended up happening? So I worked at this agency for Marshall Warehouse for a couple of years. And then there's a big national advertising agency called Young and Rubicam. So they had offices in Vancouver, Calgary, um, Toronto, Montreal. And then the, the, the mothership was in London, London, England. And the account I worked on was the Ford Motor Company. Wow. Oh, so sure. I got, got to work on cars. I'd worked on Toyota before. So uh, Ford was fun. And, uh, you know, and then we had, I would oversee the Vancouver office. So it was nice that I would fly back, you know, a couple of times a month, visit friends and family. So I have the connection with yeah. Vancouver still. Didn't have to go to Toronto very often. Uh, so that I was, that's the longest I ever stayed at a place. I was there for almost like eight years. So what, what position were you at that place? Like uh, you, creative director. Creative director. And yeah, how, so how when, that, like how did that move along as you were transitioning to different um, places? Like did you go up and up in the ladder or did you like how did you become a creative director? Yeah, so pretty much, you know, they sort of say after about eight to ten years in the business, um, well, you start off as a junior art director, so you're doing the designs, then you become the intermediate art director, the senior art director, then eventually, you know, after about eight years in the business, once you have a managerial role, you, you're overseeing teams of art directors and writers. Mm -hmm. So my role was then to oversee teams. So they would do a lot of the, the actual work. My role was, you know, making sure that they stayed on strategy. So the clients said, we want to sell to, you know, 24 year old women graduating, we want to sell them focuses or something. So as a creative director, it's a lot more managerial. I at that point, were, were you kind of, were you going from an employee to kind of being an owner at that point? Well, with this agency, I was still just an employee, but creative director managing. And also as a creative director, you're presenting the work to the clients. Yes. So you're that conduit between the client and the agency, yes. as well as working with the marketing department. Yes. So, but then, then I got fired. <laughs> <laughs> why'd you get fired <laughs> you know, so here okay so here my wife and i we're in turks and capos <laughs> you know snorkeling and having fun and i get this call you know kamachi and it's my the general manager they see shit just hit the fan it's like what's going on jim well my junior team uh and and i to this day i i have they, they did what they were they did 
they were good guys, but they actually did an ad uh, for the Winnipeg dealers. And in my absence, they did an ad and the headline on the ad was drive it like you stole it. Oh, it was, oh. it was for an ad for a, a street edition up. Ford Focus. So the Ford Focus had, you know, mags, it had low rubber, it had lights, all this kind of stuff. But the day that the ad came out, a 16 year old was sentenced for stealing a car and killing somebody. So it was just really oh, bad timing oh. because the ad was produced like a week before, right? And it just happened to happen on the same court date. Oh, so the, I guess the president of the yeah. company in Toronto got the call from Ford saying, what the hell's going up on back out west? <laughs> Ford so ad backfires in Manitoba, CBC News. It's What's that? Brother, my brother just found it. Yeah, that found it. That's crazy. We were spoofed like on, on This oh, Hour Has 22. God. It went back then. It went. It was viral for viral back then, right? Because every <laughs> news thing. And but I defended my young team, and and I my the general manager and I actually we said, we're the, we'll be the fall guys. We'll we'll take the fall. Wow. Yeah. And, wow. and the head office HR, uh, the lady there, Diane, bless her soul, she said, Mark. Well, actually, I was lucky. At that time, I had another job offer coming from another advertising agency. So I said to HR, don't, Jim doesn't have to take the fall. I will take the fall because they were my employees, even though I was on holidays. And um, they said, no, don't take the job. Don't take the job. And I said, why? Then everybody's happy. So th I, they said, we'll look after you. And I said, what does that mean? Yeah. So if don't take the job, would you come back to Toronto? It's like, hmm. why would I want to go back to Toronto? Like, well, you can come work on KFC. I went, yeah, that's from cars to KFC. No, thank you. Yeah. So they, ju they just gave me a really nice package. Oh, sweet. Yeah. And yeah. then when, when word got out that, you know, I was about to hit the streets, rather than take this other job, friends of mine were saying, I'll connect you with these people. And my wife and I said, okay, let's, let's start our own shop. We've got nothing to lose. And yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Glad yeah. Mackey's been around for about 12 or 13 years now. It was yeah, just so a you, fun little Your wife started that. Your wife, Sorry? Your wife and, and you started that, correct? Yeah. Well, I, I, could, I could never do it myself because I don't use a computer. I married someone who could. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> She crosses the I's, dots the T's, right? Absolutely. <laughs> crosses the I's, dots the T's. <laughs> the boss. Now you, know, <laughs> now you know it's not his first glass. She already said crosses the I's, you know, dots the T's. You know, that's, yeah. I'm not that person. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, this guy. Oh, oh, that's, that's unbelievable. <laughs> but yeah, like, you know, we, we met at that, after I got divorced, we met at that other advertising agency. Why did you think that you have what it, it, it takes to be an agency owner, but also an entrepreneur? So at that point in time, I was kind of freelancing and working with an agency. So I'm, I'm developing some business skills, which so many people who, who go to agencies and they're an employee their entire life. They don't get the business skills, balancing budgets, quoting jobs, presenting to the, you're doing everything, right? You're wearing a lot of hats. Yeah. yeah. And so I did a lot. I mean, even when I was in Toronto, I did a lot of freelancing. So I got, I got to understand more of the business side of things and how it's run. So that was a good transition. And, and my wife too, like she had, she's, you know, where I'm the right brain, she's the left brain. Okay. But we comp, we, we complement each other that way. So, and, and again, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a computer guy. I, I use computers for research, emails, doing things like this. But when it comes to actually designing stuff, I still use yeah. paper and Sharpie. Because if an idea isn't solid and black and white, you know, it's like you're just trying to put icing on, start to add colors and type without Fair a good enough. idea. That's right. Fair enough. If it's not a hell yes, it's a no. Exactly. 100%. Exactly. I, I couldn't agree more. That's, that's a lot of what John Shallard is like, you know? You need to create some sort of strategy or some sort of perspective or position on whatever you're selling that is different than anybody else. So when people, when people even think about your company, they're like, shit, yeah, you know, that, that, that agency, it does things different. They treat their clients different. It is, they have a really good reputation than anyone else. They did this, they, they did this, their word of mouth is unbelievable. You need to do something which is just completely backwards in a good way, you know? just needs to be completely this out of left field. But and, and you got to take risks. Yeah. You got to take risks. Yeah. Otherwise you never know. You always go, I wonder if, I wonder if, right? Yeah. yeah for yeah, sure. Yeah. For sure. Why, why the sushi? Why all the sushi? So when I moved, like, I mean, Vancouver, right? 
fresh seafood, fresh everything. So when I moved to Alberta, I'm going, crap, you know. Yeah. I mean, one of the weirdest things when I moved to Calgary was they have a naval base here. Oh, shit. Okay. Really? There's a naval museum here, right? But uh, so when I, I used to joke because, you know, every time I went back to Vancouver, to the Vancouver off, that's when I'd get my sushi fix. But, you know, you never got it as often, as often here, especially my poor wife because she wouldn't travel with me. Yeah. So whenever we're working on Ford television commercials, oftentimes if we're not shooting here in Alberta, say we have to shoot stuff for spring and summer, we shoot in BC. So we would shoot out, out like in, um, in Burnaby or all North Shore, places like that, because everything was green here. We tried one year to shoot a t television commercial for the spring. We, we blocked off like three or four houses on the street, got a crew to actually remove all the snow in oh, the dead wow. of winter. Wow. It was too much money, too much time, and too hard for the, uh, the actors. So we started shooting in BC. But I, I would say whenever we started getting uh, directors from the Vancouver market or Toronto or Calgary to pitch me and my team, I always jokingly say, bring some sushi with you. Oh. So, so that kind of stuck. So, I mean, you saw my logo, right? Yeah. If you, I don't know. If, so the logo itself, so that black ring represents the seaweed. It's yeah. the brain. It's the brain. Oh, the brain. Yeah, okay, oh, here, here we go. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Okay. the black ring represents the seaweed. The white is the rice. And the brain is what we do. Like we help build and tell stories for our clients. And if you, if you look really closely, can you see that there's a face in the brain? Yeah. There's actually oh, like eyes, see. mouth. Oh, shit. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. It's unbelievable. So we, we kind of, we, we jokingly call it brain face. But it's kind of it's kind of evil looking, and you know, like uh, Asian or European, uh, I'm sure any culture, there's always like those demonic figures, but they're, they're good luck, like they're on the corners of temples or shrines yeah, and things. Sure. You know, like at the Sikh temple too, like you see the gold statues, and, yeah. like the very demonic. But those are good luck symbols. They're they're meant to to uh, scare away evil spirits. Sure. So whenever sure. Asian people give us a business, they always go like this. They all yeah, yeah. That's what they <laughs> well, that they're giving you by giving you that they're giving you good luck. They're, they're wishing you good luck. How many times would you say no to a client because they're not a right fit? We always try and see if it works. Like we had a company within the last well, less than a year. They're a gaming company, yeah. and they came to us and said, "You know, we're we're doing this game. It's it's going to revolutionize geo searching. Those types of games." And so we started working with them and the more and more we got into it, the more and more we were losing control and they were taking over the creative process. Okay. And it came yeah. down to like, you don't need us if, if you're not going to trust what we're bringing to the table. Yeah. We made them too, too nervous, too, too off what their template was. And I, and I always say, if it's not on strategy, fine, we're guilty. But if it's on strategy and it scares you, that means there's something good there. Yeah. You know, and, and so... Anytime a client, and, and so we've walked away from clients before, and we shake hands and say thank you for the opportunity, but yeah, we're not the right fit. Because if you don't believe in being unique, being different, standing out, you know, then, you know, what, what, it's, yeah. it's nothing that nothing's going to show up on our the day, it's, it's your stamp. Your stamp is on there, and it's your brand. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, but I mean, again, you know, when we present stuff to client, often we try and present two or three directions. There's always kind of a, the very, very safe one, almost, almost to what the client wants. Then there's the one that's very safe. And then there's the one that really scares them, which is kind of the direction we always want to go. But, <laughs> you know, advertising out there right now is so bland and boring. The, and, oh, and I think just people are scared to, to take real chances, right? It's yeah. You know, I think that's why the scariest corner is this well, is because we're in a Bible belt of Canada. Yeah. Right, yeah. and a lot of our imagery that we use is like priests and nuns and like just scary stuff and like not worshiping the devil, but like we do some crazy stuff, right? And so we make these videos and stuff, and and um, I, I used to listen to a lot of Gary V. Yep. Gary oh yeah, Vee. yeah. And he's all about attention, communication, Absolutely. posting, posting as often as you can, um, and taking risks and doing things a little bit different. And 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 that's that's why I think like my whole brain set has kind of changed from listening to him and seeing those things work off. And then, so I, I used to post myself and then I hired a team or I hired a couple of, of videographers and photographers, just like one or two students. And that slowly spiraled up to two, two people who were actually in the industry 
And then um, now I'm working with people who are pretty well versed, like photographers and videographers. Right. But then I give the direction in regards to, listen, this is a good angle. This might work. This is the perspective we want. Um, and then the copy and posting, I do all the posting and copy. Um, and then all of the Facebook ads, I do a lot. Um, and then just, just that, not, not the editing, but I, I take a look at everything before it's posted yep. um, for our Facebook events, et cetera. So um, I'm a big believer in social media. You know, if I'm not, you know that's, that's, I don't believe, I, know, I, I do believe that billboard ads and radio and et cetera, it all works. But for being a small business, if you can spend a thousand dollars and almost make a hundred thousand because your copy is so good and your content is so eye catching because that's where, you know, at the end of the day, if your content isn't good, it doesn't matter how much money you put behind it. It won't do well. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. You know, if your idea isn't good, you're just selling a pile of crap to someone. It doesn't matter how much money you put behind it. Yeah. So I'm a big believer in, 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 having that dollar school as far as you can. And, and you can literally see thousand or 2000 or $4,000 make, you know, 10 X. So it's, it's unbelievable. So that just it comes down to content, but I think it comes down with practicing and doing it yourself. And so that's why I really liked your point when, uh, you know, a few minutes ago when you said, uh, um, that whole government thing and that you should be doing, you posting all your stuff on your own. So I'm a big believer in that for sure. Oh, you know, again, people are just scared to take risks and, but, Again, I'm a firm believer in push yourself. I mean, for me, like I'm an older guy and I've got my team helping me now trying to build more of a presence because I want to do more speaking engagements. I want to do more. I, I like to go on the hunt when it comes to finding clients and helping network and stuff like that and bring the work back to the studio. So, I mean, like, I, you know, you, you made that comment about my hair, right? Yeah. It, it hasn't been this long since grade 10. That's a lot. <laughs> probably actually longer than grade 10, but um, I've always done weird and wacky stuff. Like, I mean, I, I went, there, there's oh, pink. Red wow. hair. I went pink to raise, so my mom's a breast cancer survivor. Oh, wow. Yeah. Awesome. So, you know, uh, I was on the Chamber of Commerce here in Bragg Creek, and we, yeah. we did a, a fundraiser. It was funny because I was the only board member who was a guy. And all the ladies go, oh, it's a... Uh, it's breast cancer awareness. Let's do a fundraiser. Let's dye our hair pink. I went, what? <laughs> you know, yes. so I said, okay. So I went all in. All these other ladies use like temporary dye. Spray oh. them. I went full pink and for a full summer, I was pink. You know? oh, shit. But I raised, raised the most money for this fundraising drive. Yeah. Which is cool. And then, so my next, my next thing was, was going blue. Yeah. <laughs> this was for, uh, for uh, prostate cancer, because my dad's a prost well, my dad just passed away, but he's a prostate victim. But he was a he was a uh, he fought that. So I did that to raise money, and then uh, last year I was purple purple for 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 November. Oh, yeah. I, can't, I can't look at you guys got these beards. <laughs> I can't do anything there. It's it's, you know? it's, it's, a, it's Japanese heritage, man. <laughs> we have that, we yeah. have, we actually have cousins. That um, he he works. He's in Japan right now or in India. In Japan. But he he's lives and works in, in Tokyo. Um, and he's it's awesome. Like we we had an opportunity to live with him for like two weeks. I think it was. Yeah. Like ten days. Ten days. Holy shit! Japan I is one of the coolest Japan. places, man. I don't know what it is, but you guys is cultural and I think you guys believe in a lot of karma, right? Karma is what it is. We're like you do good to others, good things will happen to you. We were in the Tokyo uh, station, the train station. My right. mom had, her, had her, a bag. It was a green bag with an iPad inside of it. Yeah. And we were just at the tail, checking in, getting our tickets, making sure that we can get on the next train. Let's go get a bite to eat. So we checked in, got our tickets. So we go get a bite to eat at McDonald's, which is right there. You know, it's fun to have McDonald's in different places. So Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. we had McDonald's, yeah. right? Sat down, I'm like, mom's like, where's my iPad? I don't know where my iPad is in the green Started bag. freaking out. Freaking yeah. out. We're looking everywhere, walking around. And it's Tokyo train station. Like, it's packed, right? Yeah. We're going to Kyoto, actually. Uh, Ky Kyoto. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then we, we went back to where it was. It was sitting on the ground right there. No one picked it up. No one touched it. And, like, my, my cousin that, that lives there, he said he dropped his wallet. And he went back the next day. It was sitting there, the exact same spot where he dropped it. Wow. It's, yeah. it's something about the, the Japanese culture and the heritage is that they just believe like 
Yeah. Their, their theft and the crime is the lowest. Yeah. You know, we when we ask for, for directions, remember that time I asked they for directions one time? Out. They take you to the spot. They don't give you the directions, <laughs> they take you there. I was, they don't I, know your language, they take you there. I, I wanted to go to the washroom and the lady was literally running to find me a washroom. Like, Dude. It, like it was amazing. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Wow. Yeah, see, I've only been to Japan once, and that's when I was like 13 years old. So, like you said, I, I went there, I go, cool, KFC, McDonald's. Yeah. You know, all the yeah. Western things. I didn't really soak up the culture. So, I'd like, I'd like to get back there one day, my wife and I. I, I gotta go, man. Just for the ramen. Oh, the ramen. Or, yeah, well, exactly. Holy <laughs> shit. Unbelievable. That's ramen, the, that left the bit best impression right oh, there. Oh, my God. Oh, really? Oh, God. It was so freaking good. But yeah, no, you know, and again, like that's why with the, the the Japanese stuff. I mean, I've always been. I'm not afraid to be out there, push push buttons and cross the line sometimes. But sure. that's that's me. Yeah. If you're in entrepreneurship, I'm just gonna ask you a tough question. If you're in entrepreneurship and you're starting up, you have zero followers. You just started this company. What should you do? Stand naked on a bridge. <laughs> <laughs> why 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 would you stand naked on the you know, again if you want to again in this world we're so connected like like i say when it, you know if you're trying to hire somebody the first interview is always going to be let's check out their social media presence right it's it's all about networking connectivity um are you are you true to yourself are is your real life persona the same as your online persona and, you know, I don't know if you guys know this, but I'm also into politics. So I'm a counselor for Washington yeah. County. Yeah. And it, it's, politics is such a, to me, it's such a, excuse my Japanese, up world. Because I hate it. Th there's, so many, there's so many different sides to people. People, you know, in town that I thought I knew, you know, I hear behind the back, they go, ah, Kamachi, blah, blah, blah. It's like, you know, I just want to surround myself with people I can trust and share wine and, and beers with and and so you know but again i'm not afraid to try something different push yourself go and do something crazy that's out of your comfort zone you know start a corn maze with haunted characters right yeah, yeah started yeah. start an adventure park at a strawberry you pick place i mean like yeah that's the kind of stuff i mean i don't know what you know how hard it was for you to get your mom and dad and to transition to all the goat yoga and all these things like no, that is easy. cool. It's easy, easy. My mom, my mom is crazy. She's so is mine. Yeah. Is literally the right way to put it. She thinks of the outlandish ideas. Well, she really did think of a lot of them when she was younger. And I don't know. I, I, it's just it's about being different. And I think she knew that, like inherently knew it. She never articulated it, but her um, her action spoke. Like, you know, she created the first goat. She made, she made our, our goat building. She put a red, red barn on it and put like a, a white outline and it put a big sign saying, go tell six, kids stay free. Yeah. You know, yeah. just <laughs> kids take 25 cents or something like that. And yeah, the, we goat, were, the goats we were would known, run around there. The we, goats were would run known, around. we were known for that sign. Yeah, we, we were, were known. known. Before, before we, they knew about man farms, they knew about that sign. Sometimes you, you, you realize what works by tasting. And you just knew that worked because I would go out because I I did a lot of wine tastings like I met random people and did wine tastings in different liquor stores because I'm the wine guy. Yeah. You talk to people, you don't say anything about the business. They'd be like, "Oh, you guys are the people with the hotel. You guys have the haunted corn maze." And you know <laughs> that's the stuff that yeah. sticks because that's that's what's sticking, and you got to go with what sticks sometimes. Hundred percent. You know. Absolutely. 100%. Well, I'm sure like if you guys have read the Purple Cow. Purple cow. No, yeah. I barely read. Seth Godin, read it. I suck at reading. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, get get the get the uh, audible book. Okay. Audible book. Purple cow. So Seth Seth Godin, purple cow. Because you guys are a purple cow. Thank you. I yeah. All right. I, mean, I love I love being called a purple cow. Because <laughs> <laughs> because again, what you guys are doing is what I wish all of my clients would embrace. Because I mean, like you know, even some of the work we have on our our website some of it is wasn't the first idea that we would have liked them to take but i know it's something better than what our comp competition would have probably given them but i mean one of our you know on our, on our website we had a, a dentist a pediatric dentist come to us 
and he had the world's ugliest logo and but he trusted what we do like he trusted that we're the advertising branding experts he's the dentist and one of the first things we do whenever a client comes to us is I want to get to know everything about their product or their service and with him I said well I want to come and hang around your your dentistry office he goes awesome okay and and uh, so I went down there and you immediately walk into the place and if you're a little kid right going to the dentist you're just scared to that's the scariest day of your life type of thing mm -hmm. well you walk in there he had a ballroom a pillow room a games room fish tanks it was really cool uh -huh. Well, when you went into the, the room where you get your cavities fixed, because, you know, the, it's like, you know, you're going to get a dentist and drills and stuff like this. Well, the kid who's sitting at the chair, he'd be like, and around the ceiling, along the room, he had one of those mechanical trains. That oh, just, wow. So he'd come and say, okay, Billy, you know, we're going to drill your face, but before, before we do that, you know, we're going we're gonna to wait till the train goes around twice. And Billy would be going, okay. And then, He'd sit there and be mesmerized by the train. The dentist will come back, do the work. Billy's done. And then Billy doesn't want to go home because yeah. he's had such a great experience. Wow. You know, the, the ballroom, the fish, the, the cavity wasn't a big issue. Yeah. And so when we went to rename his company, we always jokingly in the office, we used to go choo-choo. So chew with your mouth. Choo-choo is the sound of a train. Yeah. And thought, That's what you do with your mouth. Then we said to the client, Brad, go, Brad, Okay, this is, we want to call your company Choo Choo Dentistry. And the logo is a bear with and the muzzles actually in the shape of a tooth. And he immediately said, Yeah. And like, we went, Really? You, <laughs> and we went full bore with it. So and funny. so, oh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. those are the type of clients that you want. That's Ones that will really, you know, who want to, who want to be part of the uh, process, but they let you do what you do. Leave the impression. Leave the impression. Okay, Absolutely. I got I got, I got another question for you. It's kind of more selfish. I, I think I'm sick and tired of hiring students and working with students and showing them the ropes of what, you know, it's not, a, it's not like as a photographer and designer, of course you need to put your own editing style on there and you need to, you need to you know, be proud of your own work. Yep. But at the end of the day, even if my advice and my direction is one thing, but it's irrelevant, it's what the people want. You know, it's what, it's what my, 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 my people, my customers are here intrigued and, and like, and it's just that psychology of knowing, okay, so for, I can give you a simple example. If it's a photographer, I'm struggling with this one photographer who likes to take pictures up close and like in, in the person's face and you don't get the background and the entire scenery and the, the, the whole farm atmosphere and experience in the right. picture. And like, for example, in a pumpkin patch, it's all about landscape photography and big, large, open scenery and just pumpkins that go on forever. It's like, shit, I want to go there. I want to get a picture of it. You know, that's what people think. Right. And it's like, I, I, I don't want to hire people like that. I want to hire someone who has experience. But then at the end of the day, I, I'm not ready to pay $80,000 in a salary rate, you know, and then having to direct that person. Um, where do you see small businesses? And I do, like, because I still believe in posting myself. I don't think that I would ever give up having um, someone else posting for me all the time. It's okay if they post, you know, once a day, twice a day, but like I like to post three times a day when I'm really into it. Right. Like when I don't have any Facebook ads running, like I have a lot of Facebook ads running right now, but I like to post at least two to three times a day. Um, but then where do you see, you know, a company like myself where I don't want to let go of that control of posting because I, I still love doing it. And it's good for the business, you know? Um, and I, I also, honestly, I feel like it would, it, it would take me so much time to teach someone. I don't know. It depends on who I, who I make. And, and again, like, you know, I'm a huge, uh, I teach one day a week at the Alberta University of Arts. And, and part of that for me is to surround myself with 20 somethings, get to know what they're like. What, what, what do they eat? What type of music do they listen to? What TV shows? Because if a client comes to me and says, you know, I have a product that I have to sell to 20 somethings. I have a good idea what they're like besides just having kids that age. But um, students, uh, you have to be the mentor because students yeah. are there. They're sponges, right? Yeah. Well, if, if you want something based on what you want, hire someone who's seasoned, who understands that. 
Yeah. Versus, someone young will want to try and put their own stamp on things, but if you want what you want, hire the professional or really, really spell it out that this is what I want from you. Because young people will always try and, and impress their bosses, right? But yeah, um, you know, again, when I hire students, and a lot of my students have worked with me and gone on to great, great careers, and my job is to just let them watch and, and be a, a role model. What is the position you think that I need? Because at the end of the day, I, I think content is king, right? Absolutely. So Absolutely. Content, and regardless of what the freaking strategy is or how nice the graphic design looks or what the aesthetic is, if you don't have right good content, people don't care, yep. right? I think content is king. So I need someone who can take photos and make videos, right? But then I also, I need someone who can understand what people want. And so I think there's a bit of psychology mixed into it, but... Well, so, and this is one of the things we find with a lot of our clients is, you know, Ad Mackey is uh, the content storytellers, whether it's a video, a print ad, a social media post, a billboard, a radio spot, you know, they come to us and say, okay, I need to talk to this audience. It's a mom. She's 42. She's got teenage kids, you know, and, and then we come back to say, okay, the way we're going to reach her because this mom spends, you know, an hour a day, with her kids in the car, we might be able to get her with, with radio because um, she, she listens to this station. Or, you know, at nighttime, she pours herself a glass of wine and watches Dancing with the Stars. So yeah. there's a TV show where we could do a TV ad if you had the budget. Yeah. Or, you know, or she spends a couple hours a day on Facebook chatting with her friends, catching up on things. So then we might hit her with. So understanding who your target audience, when you try and be all things to all people, that's where everything gets weak. And people think, Clients always think that, you know, if I'm going to spend a lot of money, got to reach a lot of money. Yeah. You're going to get better spending that money, focusing on someone who's going to be an influencer for your brand, product, service, or whatever, right? Because their connections will be more relevant to your business and your brand. So versus trying to speak to everybody at once. Um, getting back to like, so I mean, I think you should be hiring people who understand the business. Then they'll understand when you say, I need this, you know, because if – if you hire a student, they have no experience. They're, no. That's what they're just, and it's they're like too scared to think on their own. I'm like training them every day. And, you know, and that's, that's, yeah. That gets really, it gets really hard. You don't have any time, right? At the end of the day. And it's fine. Like I did that. Like there was four people working here inside the office that we're sitting in that all they would do is just marketing. They, you know, one person was doing illustrations. Other person was editing a video. Uh, the third person had to go do a photo shoot. You know, it was just, that's all they would do, you know, on a day-to-day, day-to-day basis. So I have, like, a shit ton of content. Like, a shit ton of really good content. Okay, but are you the creative director for your business? Essentially, yeah. Okay, because, yeah. I mean, I, I think, if anything, you, you should be working with an advertising agency that has the illustrators or the photographers providing the content. Then they just give you the content and you post away versus yeah. you trying to control all these things. Yeah, but do you think that maybe it's – because, like, for example, sometimes, like – my, my mom, like she, uh, we know that we need signs made, right? Signs that say, uh, buy your donuts here, right. buy your uh, ice cream here. Um, you can order food at the scale, right? So yeah. at that point, like I need it done fast. And for me to do it fast, that means I need to have someone in house that can make all these things within right. half an hour, follow our brand guidelines, get right. that stuff to the, to the, what's it called? The printer shop and then pick it up the next day. Cause it's, we, we're, it's, it's an event. An event zone only are based off limited time. Once that time passes, you can't bring that event back. That's so in your Brad Guidelines book, put a section in there for signage. Okay. So if, you, so if you have your brand guidelines somewhere in a PDF form, you can send it to the printer and say, hey, I need signs that say, you know, do not step on the cow patch or whatever. And then they send you a proof and you go, okay. And then, then you don't have to do it internally. Ah, uh, okay. So, then you're, so like you can have brand guidelines that – not only the colors of your logo, how it's used, all that kind of stuff, but you could also put in there if you wanted, you know, have templates for signage, templates for ad layouts. Temp- you could even have templates for, you know, for social media, Facebook posts. Hey, well. Shit, you could, you're saying outsource that to the printers. Well, no, but you should still have you or your brand manager make sure you create that brand guideline with everything in there. Yeah, and then, of course. And then, so, because, I mean, that's what the grand lot that bought. But that book is for us. If, if somebody wants to use your logo for an event or something, they have to understand that you cannot change the colors, stretch it, 
I, but it's the access though. It's the access and the time that it takes. Like for example, say if Jason or, or if you, you're the agency that came on and it's the access, like I need it done today type of thing. And like if they're in house, I can have them do it and make it today. Cause like I'm sitting here with them and I can just go over it with them. You know, it's fast, it's quick, it's easy, but in a long run, it takes more time. You know, for if, you know, when a client comes to us and says, I need something ASAP, most times we'll say, we, we're not going to do it immediately because, you know, if they're panicking about something, sit back for, you know, one night and think about what you're really asking for. Is yeah. it really what you need? You know, uh, that's one of the hardest things for businesses to say to clients is to say no, you know, because it may not be, you know, Amir, it's, it's not a sign you need. You know, you're going to reach more people with doing a social media post, you know. Oh, right. Okay. More, I, or, I mean, again, that, that's what we, we always, when a client says to us, I need this, and we always question, why do you need that? You know, yeah. and so oftentimes for us, you know, we're working with a new, uh, hopefully we, we get them as a client, but they're into pest control. Sweet. And they came to us with a panic about a brochure, and I said, whoa, 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 what's the brochure for? You're, you're trying to rebrand based on a brochure or you know, look at your whole brand. Is everything connected? Is a social media uh, post going to make me think of your brand when I see your website or when I see one of your trucks driving by or when I see, you know, thing, everything's got to tie together for your brand strategy, right? So when you start piecemealing to a video company, uh, 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 a sign shop or whatever, it starts, it starts eroding. And that's one of the things that's always hardest to train our clients. But we always say, when you hire us, we become your brand police. So when you need something, like if you're thinking of something, go, oh, shit, I need a sign. You know, you'll just email Mark or Tanya and say, hey, I need a sign for this. And immediately we're going to say, what's it going to be? Who's it going to be? Where is it going to be located? You know, and, and ask you, is this really what you need? Sometimes yeah. it's all you need, right? But yeah, yeah, yeah. we... It's, whereas where we become like we always sell ourselves as agencies or companies that hire us we go we're your creative department down the hallway I we're, we're there when you need something like all of a sudden like this someone might come to you and say you know the abbotsford air show sponsorship or we're going to have a farmer's market at the abbotsford air show do you guys want to buy a booth and you're going holy crap i've never done a booth before then you then you would call your ad shop or your creative to say like you know we got this opportunity to set up a booth you know how to do you pick, so you know how to set things up. But how do we then, out of all the other booths that are going to be there, my job is to make sure that people come to you, right? Yeah. No, I, I over all the other booths. So that's kind of fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. That's fair. It's hard when, when, like, we oftentimes that's where we start working with clients because they're trying to do everything themselves. Yeah. And they that they stop doing what they're supposed to be doing. Very true. Yeah. Mark, um, when you're this is, uh, switching gears a little bit. Yep. When you're um, hiring somebody, what are your what are your favorite interview questions? Um, I some of the interview questions I usually ask are, "Who's your favorite hockey team?" <laughs> okay. Are you a dog person or a cat person? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, why, I'm why, to, why, 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 why? Because you know, you you might be the most talented artist in the world, but if your attitude is I'm the greatest in the world. I don't want to work with you because uh, you got to be a team player. You got to be able to take, you know, no for an answer. You got to be able to take criticism and you got to even take criticism and throw it back at me, even though I'm your boss and I've got decades more experience. Any uh, criticism that is strategy is not personal. It's just, you know, why did you use red? You know, well, it's, it's because it's an aggressive color. It's going to make people's blood boil. And that's what we want to do. It's going to be a, a Halloween corn maze with, yeah, blood all over. Okay, but you know, uh, everything we do, like whether it's a color, the t type of font, I always make sure my artists, my art directors say, you know, oh, it's because I like pink. No, why did you pick pink? Because pink represents soft and colors and, and perfume and because we're designing yeah. a package for young girls and their first perfumes. Okay, it's not because you like it personally, it's, it's because it's got a have a, a strategy and a, a rationale behind it. But yeah, I always try and make it, I always try and make interviews. I want them to get to know me as much as I want to get to know them. Yeah. You know, and like I said, the first interview, if someone's approaching me is I'll go online and see what they're doing. Yeah. You know? yeah. Because sometimes you'll hire someone who comes across as, you know, calm and collected. And then I go, Hey Bob, I was looking on your Facebook and man, you like to party, you know? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. You know, some people are very different than their social media presence. Yeah, very true. Yeah. And I'm, I'm all about team players, people who, can, who are going to be part of the, the, the machine. Long, long run, yeah. No, very much. So. Do you do all your hiring? Uh, pretty much, yeah, because yeah. most of the hires we do are creative people. And you know, and for me, it's someone who shows a lot of passion and and desire to to want to learn. Yeah, sweet. Yeah. Your um, your take. I think I watched one of your videos. It was a little bit about how we're gonna move forward in our current situation with COVID, and how businesses are going to move forward. Um, I think I think you were just alluding to it, but you never really got into it. Where, is, where, did, where did I write this down? I wrote it, sent this down. Wow, it's cool. Somebody watched one of my videos. Of course. How do we prepare, prepare for a new way of doing things in the industry? As, okay. Well, as communicators, and I think you were saying as creative directors and as creators, you guys are all about creating new solutions for the problems at hand and looking at ways differently. I think that's what you were kind of alluding to. But what did you, could you elaborate a little bit on that? Well, you know, as I mentioned, I, I teach one day a week. And in the old days before COVID, you know, I go to, I go to the university. I sit there with my students. I, I jabber on for about an hour. And for the, the remaining three and a half hours, I meet with them individually, one-on-one, -on -one, and I critique their work. And I take my Sharpie and I tell them to do this and we exchange yeah. ideas. With, with everything being online now, it's like, holy crap. It's, yeah. it's not four and a half hours now. It's 12 hours to go through students. And, and we're, like I say to my students, I'm learning as much as you are because for us to be doing online classes, so much is missing because I don't get, you know, right on your work and scribble on it and we get to exchange ideas together one-on-one. -on -one. It's so much different. And I think, yeah. but I, at the same time, there's a positive with COVID too because while some shops are slowing down, uh, shops like us, we've been busy. We have we that first yeah. month it was kind of what everybody was trying to figure out what to do. Soon as they locked down borders and and things like that, because we had restaurant clients. God forbid you're a restaurant, right? But we had um, clients who were um, tourism based, and you got no no one coming for the summer. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. We were lucky that though we had already previously done the work for the summer, so we've already been paid. But all of a sudden they're loosening restrictions. So everything for us moved forward. But at the same time, you know, uh, you have to start thinking um, in new ways. How, you know, how did, well, it opened up doors for us because we do work with an agency. We actually have another advertising agency that's hired us to do creative work for them out of Toronto. Wow. Which, yeah. is, which is cool for us. Yeah. You know, but because they're, they're so busy, they, they came to us. And, and, and again, it was a, a network from, from, from a long time ago, but that's the power of networking, but it allows them to tap um, because no one's expecting you to be face to face anymore. Yeah, that's right. It's easier to do stuff online so we can do things. So there's more trust in, if you can trust the people, even though you're going on a screen, it, there's still work to be had. And like I said, we've been getting busier and, and, and uh, how, how, do you think that is it, is it normal for you guys now in regards to dealing with clients in face-to-face -face interactions and are you guys just as busy? Some of our clients are comfortable with face-to-face. -face. Um, those that are older aren't, but like I said, we do a lot of municipalities. So they're out of, we've already always kind of been doing this because they're uh, an hour or two away or things like that. I see. But I think people are more accepting now of this new way. And, yeah. You know, we're going to be doing this for at least wow. like we are now for a while. Yeah, a while. So if you, if yeah. you can't adapt, you're, you're, you're yeah. screwed, right? Yeah. If you can't pivot, you're, you're yeah. not. You're so not. you got to try and, and, you know, like we're honest with our clients. It's like we've said to some, it's so, sometimes it's hard to work. Because I am a people person. I am a sit down and, and, and sit at a pub and work on stuff together with clients or meet face to face. You get yeah. more done that way. And, and, you, and they get to engage in the process as well. If you make them feel part of the process, it's easier to sell it to them. I still want to talk about like the competitive atmosphere around agencies. You know, you've been in the industry for decades, essentially, right? Yeah. Uh, you saw the, the Ford thing. That was in 2008. And you said before then you've been, you've been jumping it from here to there to there. So how do, you, like, how do agencies navigate such a competitive environment? You know? 
where sometimes you're almost like a pipeline, like you're, you're a place that does a really great job. There's a new, new student that comes in, you teach them everything they know, and then there's a bigger agency that comes in and takes them. How do you, how do you deal with that? I'd say, go give it a shot. Yeah. The best advice I ever got when I was that age was, if you're not getting, if you're at a shop and you're not being challenged, if you're working on the same kind of stuff all the time, go somewhere else. Like until I started working with YNR, Young and Rubicam in in, in uh, Calgary here, I never stayed anywhere for more than two years. Mm. I always want. I want to work on the cars. I want to work in fashion. Yeah. I want to work on food. Yeah. I want to work on different things. Uh, so like with you know, even with my art director now, she's been with us six years. When people join us, I say I don't. I hopefully. I can't keep you interested in other types of business, then uh, move on. Yeah. Come back yeah. later. You know. Fair enough. But I, I think Mark is, you, you focus a lot on quality too, though. Like, you know, you just saying that you go, you went to the dentist's office and you hung out. I don't think many people do that. No. You know, they'll have like one client meeting and then they'll, they'll say, okay, we're going to have a brand discussion, you know, which is like all day or something. But they don't go to, that shop and spend days there and time there is that you have a passion for it. So I think Mark's passion and it's, it's authentically you, you are that brain. Yeah. You know, no. that, that's what stands out. Even like, cause even with our clients, I will never be as smart as they are about their business. But the more, like I did, we did some work for Wild Rose Brewery. I said to my art director, take a bunch of friends, go to their pub, go to the brewery, have fun and tell me what the experience was like Yeah, and, and bring me the bill. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. this, this bug client I talked to, I was presenting to them last week and I said, you know, can I go on one of your service tech calls to see what they do when they're trying to find mice problems or cockroaches or whatever? And she's kind of going, really? I said, well, yeah, if I get a sense of what your crew is going through and what you do in your business, it makes my job easier to come up with creative. 100%. No different than say you guys and your wines, you know, really understand how hard it is to grow strawberries and pick strawberries yeah. and process them for what I mean, first hand knowledge is is always the first thing I would say. Even if we're pitching a client, like say, you know, we pitched a client in Sylvan Lake. I drove all the way up there in the middle of winter, drove my vehicle out to the middle of the lake, took some pictures and, and in the presentation, pictures of me with my truck on the lake. It showed them that, wow, he came all the way out here, mm. took pictures just to pitch the business, even though we didn't get it. Yeah. They'll yeah. remember us for next time, right? Yeah. So these are the type of things that I always say to, to the students. A lot of these, you know, again, our business has become, well, I mean, probably yours too. I mean, it's become so uh, car, com, compartment, compartment, mentalized, whatever that word is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pieces, okay? yeah. I mean, um, in our business now, it used to be that the advertising agency would hire the, the videographers, all the people, and then go to the client. Now, clients, like what you're doing now, Amir, is going direct to the videographers, to the, to the, the designers, to the... Yeah. That kind of starts to erode your brand. It's harder to rein it all back in. It is. This was the difficult yeah. part. Is, yeah. No, yeah. I, I, re I really believe in that, you know, being hands-on with, with, your, with your, your uh, customers. Um, something that we just did, we just got into Save on Foods as, as a winery because they have some wine accounts here yeah, uh, there's 21 stores in the BC. We're in all 21 stores. Um, I've personally visited 20 stores myself, um, and I, I got to go to one more. It's in Parksville, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna head up there. Um, but the sometimes you don't realize what is gonna make a difference. Like you don't calculate these things. Like you had this one conversation that you'll use later. Like for instance, we had. Um, a couple of head buyers here from Save On Foods in the wine industry. Um, and there was a few of their team leads, that's what they call it, like the managers at the, at the locations. Right. And because I had gone to the Save On Foods in Sydney, in Victoria, I met with the team lead there. And her name was Micheline. And during that meeting, like we, we gave them the whole tour of the farm, the whole tour of the winery. And we sat down and we paired our wine with a different Indian foods. I just brought up her name, Micheline. And they were blown away yeah. that, I, that I just knew that person's name. I had a conversation with her. Like I knew she was a mixologist by trade. Like she went to, she teaches um, like mixed drinks courses. And I brought up her name and that blew them away. And me going out there and talking to her, 
I didn't calculate that I was going to use that going forward as as a sales no, right so you know those are like the things that you don't realize that go a long way and I'm sure you've been in the industry for a long time those things are residuals they're residuals I, right it's, the, it's the, those little heartfelt moments absolutely yes. they, they yes. pay 10 times in in, in in dividends when you're just being you yes. exactly you know exactly no exactly those, those, those are those are the great stories that to them they go wow this guy really cared and remembered somebody's yeah. name and it's like yeah absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. And, and those are those are you know whether it's an ad or you know somebody who comes to your farm just asking for directions or something and the fact that you know they're not there to buy buy anything but they're, they're lost you know how do i get to hope right I don't you know those are the things that people remember and that's what i always say to people everything you want to do make it memorable make it emotional yeah. it's got to be emo the emotions are what trigger the memory of hope. 100%. Yeah, emotions are. I heard emotions are the byproduct of memories. So Absolutely. Every memory you have in the past is you, is, is leads to you. You, th you think about an emotion that you've had. I listened to that yesterday. Nice. Right, so, uh, how do you become a pie eating champion? Holy shit! That's a good <laughs> <laughs> this guy. <laughs> well, you know, it, it was funny. It's it's technique. It's all in technique. You got you got to flip the pie over, and if you can get through that bottom crust. Then it, it's it's easier. Oh, really? But but yeah, because I did it the year before, and I go, wow, I sucked. It was like, because I'm trying to eat it from the top. I saw the guy who won flipped his pie plate over, pulled, yanked the tin foil off, and then attacked it that way. It doesn't slide around as much. And uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. Oh. How many how many pies did you eat? Was it like a time? Well, no, it was just, it was it was one normal like whatever nine inch, ten inch pie plate. It was yeah. just first to finish. Oh, really? how, long, how long did it take? Well, oh, it felt like forever. Probably like a few minutes. Wow. But like, I'm, I'm, I'm like, like these guys are like three times my size, like fire. <laughs> so yeah. Is, is, isn't, isn't the hot dog eating championship, isn't that guy Japanese too? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> must be in the jeans. <laughs> this guy walked up like, oh, not this guy. Not, not Mark. No, oh, no exactly. Man. Shit. Oh, it was fun. It was a lot of fun, but yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. Uh, no, it's sweet, man. Thank you so much, Mark. I really appreciate your time. All the best. Thanks, thanks again for this. It was a lot of fun, you guys. Oh, sure. That was sweet.